Okay, looks like I'm back, possibly. Let me see. I can screen share. Yeah, there we go. So we're, uh, we're making mod inks in my lab right now. I have a, a few dedicated students coming in and we've been making mod inks and it is really exciting today. Wait, what are mod yeah. inks? Uh, mod inks are metal organic decomposition inks. And um, uh, it's a fancy way of saying uh, an ink that um, produces a metal film when you cure it. So let's see here. Oh, there we go. There I am. There I am. I, I'm jaundiced today. I don't know what about it. But um, yeah, so we've been making mod inks. Let me, let me go get a sample. I'll be right back. Uh, I'll bring these back. Yeah. I'm just trying to, I'm showing off. So it's funny because uh, back when I was in Chapel Hill, um, <clears throat> we made uh, brust chiffrin net gold nanoparticles, and uh, we did some thermal analysis on them. We did a, a differential scanning calorimetry, and uh, the damn things, they just turn into to the most beautiful gold films. You load up this pan, heat it up to 300 degrees, and all the ligands pop off, and you get these beautiful gold films. And uh, uh, and what we're trying to do now is is make copper films. For example, this is a copper film. This is our current state of the art. Okay, come on, focus, focus. Eh, doesn't want to focus. Anyway, these are the current state of the art um, films. And you can you can see they look coppery, and they, they these conduct pretty well. And these are these are made from uh, this is the ink. This is a, a copper formate with um, um, two, two amino ethanol and one butanol. So this is sort of like a mixture of inky stuff, but I'm super psyched because this morning my student, John Luca came in and just like, hey, what are we gonna do today, Dr. T? I said, okay, let's pick up where we left off. Like he went on vacation, so it was a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and we got out the old inks and we made some new ink. The new ink didn't work, but these old inks, they just aged beautifully. And so they make this they make this thin film, this thin purple film on glass, which is really, really like a super good quality for us because we're making the gold onto glass uh, films. So that was kind of exciting. Uh, <clears throat> but um, so um, what shall we do today? I, I'm I'm ready to I'm ready to 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 blurb on if that's what we want to do. I'm just not. Uh, let me check in with everybody and see how you're doing. And um, uh, and uh, if you have, do you guys did an experiment today, right? Or no, I think we're. They doing showed that. you a free. You're doing it tomorrow or something. I think so. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, you know, this is the one of the more 
the more painful parts for me about the online format because, you know, it, part of being a chemist is just going into the lab and doing stuff, you know? And I really, you know, um, and I confess that I dropped the ball a little bit. I had some experiments I was going to prep and send to you guys, but I just, I just didn't get to it. Um, like one of them, for example, it's so simple. And if you want to, I can send you the things, but it's to make nanotubes. Uh, it's kind of origami nanotubes because, um, and, and I'll show you this later on, but you know, if you have that hexagonal pattern printed, then you can, you can roll the tubes into different, like there's basically two ways to roll the tube that are like 60 degrees off. And then there's all these different ways in between that form chiral tube structures. And it's kind of fun, you know, it's an interesting activity that's, gives you some connection to the way the atoms are actually connecting. So um, we'll try to do that. I'm not sure how successful we'll be. Um, and also one thing I really wanted to do and my plans were just kind of too big was I wanted to 3D print everybody a, a little Venn diagram. You know what a Venn diagram it is where you have the three circles that intersect, you know? And, and, and you, if you put a polarizer into each circle, you can get it so that the first and the third polarizer are completely blocking. But if you put a polarizer in between at the right polarization angle, light will come through. And it's a real interesting uh, exploration into the way that um, uh, 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 quantum uh, the quantum particles work because um, it's uh, it's like it's a little bit like the spin experiment. There's one called the Stern Gerlach experiment. Let me see who's trying to get me here. No, it's probably Slack. Is somebody slacking me? But, oh, actually, you know what I should probably do? Um, uh, it's like the Stern Gerlach was when you pass these, they, they use silver, silver radicals, right? Silver atoms. They pass them through a magnetic field and then some go down and some go up, right? Some go towards the south and some goes towards the north, right? But nothing in between. It's kind of like weird, like what? What magnetic, I mean, the atoms are all isotropically, everything, you know? But still, the poles are either up or down. Boom, aligned or anti-aligned with the field, right? Then you can do it again. You can take one of those subpopulations, put it through another pair of magnets, boom, you get the same effect. Isn't that weird? And it's the same thing with photons, right? You can put photons through one polarizer and then another one that blocks them, right? This makes all this polarization, right? And that won't go through. But if you put them through another, a 45 degree, then you get all that polarization and some comes through this, the third polarizer. It's just too weird for words. And um, so, you guys have to figure that shit out, man. I don't know. It's your, it's your world now. I give up. I give up. It's all up to you. <laughs> it is too weird. Too weird. Okay. So, um, so last time we talked about um, uh, making MOs, right? And I was telling you how um, to make a, uh, a psi and a psi star, you just take the symmetric, symmetric and the anti-symmetric combination of these guys. And you can think about it, about it as like taking this one plus minus one times. It's like this one minus this one, right? And if you subtract them, this part stays, let's say you take minus one times SB, right? So the red turns to blue. 
and that's still there and that's still there, but in the middle they cancel, right? That's kind of how that works. And then plus one times plus one, this makes the symmetric combination. It's probably not exactly right to think of it that way, but it's it's not exactly wrong either, right? And um, the the you can build the atoms up because of the poly exclu exclusion principle. So um, first of all, there's a couple of principles involved. One is called the Aufbau, and second is called the Pauli principle. You guys know those or no? Okay, so Pauli, Aufbau, Pauli and Aufbau. Okay, forget it. <laughs> so I got it. I got some of you know, so just hang in and I'm going to try to explain it to the rest of you. And you can make fun of me at how shitty a job I do explaining. So let's see a new share. No, wait. I think I have to turn on my, I think I have to turn on my webcam. Hold on. Come on. Oops. There she is. There she is. Okie doke. Okay. You are screen sharing. New share. Document. Okay. All right, so, uh, ah, yes. So there's the outbound and the poly principle, right? So if you have a couple of atoms here, a couple of, let's say just a couple of protons there, right? And they're about um, half an angstrom apart. Uh, let me see. Then, um, uh, and you can take, and you just have these fixed in space here, right? They're on, they're somehow, there's a cosmic rod fixing these guys in space, right? And then you let a couple of electrons float in, right? And you and 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 what will happen is that by some mechanism, these electrons will occupy a state um, wherein. Wait, are you drawing something right now? Yeah, can you guys not see it? Oh, it, it went away, oh. didn't it? Oh, he's screen sharing. Okay, sorry. right now it just shows us the uh, the two protons. Okay, hold on. Should be back. Should be back. It looks like two eyes, right? Yeah, yeah. Think, it's it's think. kind of laggy, but yeah, we can see it. Oh Jesus! I've got all new hardware here. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, lag, 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 lag. But so the the electrons will occupy a state then where they are most likely to exist in the middle here, right? And so the overall hydrogen atom or hydrogen molecule will look kind of like this. And most of the electron density will be found in a space between the nuclei, right? Because <clears throat> this is actually lower energy than, lower potential energy than this. Right, if you have a single proton, 
and a single 1s electron, right? And then when they come together, they form a hydrogen molecule like that, you know? So you can, that's another way to imagine them building up. And when I, when I say that this is a lower potential energy situation, what, what, what do I mean by that? They don't take as much energy to like exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good answer. They don't have, so um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they don't have as much energy. Go ahead, Lucas. To do things essentially um, to react. Right, right, yeah, it's true, it's true. Their kinetic energy is lower. Their potential energy is lower. <clears throat> what does that mean about the forces? Actually, not quite sure how to put it this way, but what does that mean about the forces on the individual electrons and the protons? The IMS are stronger, right? The forces are stronger? The intermolecular forces are stronger. Uh-huh. So, right, right, right. So, right. So the, the force on this proton and on this proton, what that, what that means is that it, this proton is now restricted in its movement relative to this proton, right? Because now, now they can both move to the right or they can both move to the left or up and down and out, right? That's fine. But if they wanna move relative to one another, then there's a potential energy cost, right? And the way that we normally express that is by writing a uh, uh, potential energy diagram here. We can say E, versus R, right? And R is the, the distance there, right? And here's zero, and here's say two angstroms. And if this R zero is about one angstrom, uh, also equal to 0 0.1 nanometers, then, and we're to say, we're to talk about the potential energy of this whole system, proton one plus proton two plus electron one plus electron two, right? Then, and we go to one angstrom here, there's zero, one, and two, right? Then will the potential energy at this radius be high or low? At which radius? At, at R equals one angstrom. Oh, it would be low if, or, well, mm -hmm. when, wait, does the H2 represent two angstroms or? So, so uh, this is the energy, the potential energy of all the particles in this H2 molecule. So E H2 potential. versus the, the, the bond length, R. So then if one hydrogen is one angstrom, then wouldn't it be high? Ah, so, so, so this R is the distance between the, the two, the two uh, nuclei, right? So the two hydrogens or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so if this is like high and this is low, then you're saying that they, when they're at this distance, their potential is high. Oh, no, it would be low. It would be low. If, okay. Yeah. I don't know, man. That's, you got a 50 50 shot here. You got to make up your mind. I mean, well, assuming that one <laughs> is when like the, the H2s are together and they're one angstrom apart, then I'd assume it'd be low. Uh-huh. All right. Going back to a spring. If we have a spring and there's no force on the spring 
And this spring is one angstrom. And then we, then we add force and we compress that spring until now it's one half an angstrom. Has the spring done work on the universe or has universe done work on the spring? Universe has done work on spring. I love how you dropped the, the, that's beautiful. Jerry, what do you think? You've got a spring and you, you smash it down. Have you done work on the spring or has the spring done work on you? I'm sorry, I'm muted. Uh, you, you should have done work on the spring. I mean, it's up to us to define this, right? Lucas, what do you think? Um, I was just gonna say, didn't you say last time that the reason that the potential energy is lower when they're um, together is because the electrons spend more time in the middle and they're farther apart from the, uh, from the uh, nucleus than they would be individually? Um, okay, so I think what I was trying to say is that when the electrons, when this whole set of two protons and two electrons condense into a molecule, right, then that, that, that process is spontaneous, right? If you just have a little space and you got two electrons and two protons and, and, and they're zipping around and they can give away some energy, then they condense into this, right? They condense into a molecule, right? And in that molecule, the average distance between plus and minus is low compared to the isolated atoms, right? I mean, there's, there's um, the potential energy terms here are R uh, HH for the protons, R, call H1, H2, right? R, H1, E1, R, H1, E2, R, H2, E1, and R, H2, E2. Right? One, two, three, four, five. Have I forgotten one? I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think that's all the potential energy terms that there are. That's where all the potential energy comes from, right? Is from those distances. And these are all cool, these are all straightforward, you know, uh, Q1, Q2 k over r squared terms you know is the energy for each of those right and and it's a well known fact that this is more stable than that that this molecule is more stable than the separated atoms in fact by quite a bit So far, we're on the same page, right? Yes, thank you. Cool. So, um, so it's like saying that, you know, that that this R here, though, this is special, right? This this is R equals R E Q. Like it's like the average proton-proton uh, distance in a hydrogen molecule, right? So there's, there's a minimum energy configuration for that molecule, yeah? So now, um, if that molecule were like a spring 
and you were to smash that spring into a smaller space, would you be doing work on the spring or would the spring be doing work on you? Wait, could I propose an idea? Yes, you can. Would, okay. Would yes. possibly the spring yes. be doing work on you only because if you like, how do I say it? If you're like squishing it, it's probably going to want to go back to the position it was in originally. So then it's going right. to back. Right, right, right. So, um, so, um, uh, so this is sort of <laughs> the relaxed state of the spring, right? up here. And this is the squish state, right? And if you let go of this squish state, it's going to wind up back in the relaxed state somehow, right? Or it's going to vibrate. How am I, how am I doing, Sedona? So far, so good, more or less? More or less. More or less, less or more? Um. I'm kind of lost. Like, I don't really know how this spring ties to this right now, but. Uh, I understand. Okay, so, um, Sadana, so imagine that you and Raymond are hydrogen atoms. You each have one possession in this entire world an electron, right? And you hold on to that electron and you like to keep it in its 1s state because that electron is valuable to you somehow. Right? But then you meet Raymond and Raymond has an electron too. And somehow, because you're a really positive person, You like his electrons. And Raymond, he likes your electrons, right? There is an inevitable attraction. Coulomb's law, man. And so as you guys come together, right, your positive charge can feel these two negative charges from Raymond. And Raymond can feel two positive charges or two negative charges from you, right? His own electron and your electron, right? So now there is a way for you guys to come out of nowhere and reach an equilibrium, reach a minimum energy state. Yeah? What do you think, Raymond? Is this a bunch of BS? Well, I think I like kind of follow it. I think I was like kind of following it before too, so. I think like the metaphor. Oh, you've, you've, oh, the metaphor helps or is not helpful? Yeah, it's pretty helpful. Okay, good. Okay, good. I'm going to go with it then. All right. So now, so now one thing about that state that, that these two hydrogen atoms find themselves in when that state energy is minimal, um, the electrons for Sedona and Raymond tend to be in between them, right? Right, they tend to be in the middle. And that reduces, I mean, the, the, the protons, which are really the identities of Raymond and Sedona, they actually repel, right? But their electrons, which are their personalities, they mix, right? And they create this state where there is an attraction overall between the two atoms right? Because the personalities mix. Now, if you push them too far together, if you try to push these two closer, then no more. They, they no longer are happy, right? Similarly, if you pull them apart, 
they become less happy, right? So there's a, there's a place where their potential energy is a blank, Caleb. Uh, I'm actually not too sure. Shi Ming. Shi Ming, what am I going to say here? What's my next word? Wait, what? I, I didn't get What? It. What? <laughs> No, 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 no. There's a place where the potential energy is a minimum, right? Where there's no longer any attractive or repulsive force felt by these nuclei, right? They have reached their equilibrium bond length they will neither go further closer or further apart, right? In fact, what they will do is that they will oscillate. And that energy they oscillate with is called the zero point energy and it is always there, it is never going away, period, zip. Mathematical certainty. Right, Lucas? Excellent, cool. So, I'm going to say that this is a minimum. Now, when these two protons touch, that's not good. So we're not going to let them touch, right? So we're going to say that the energy goes way up there. It reaches a minimum. And then it comes up. But then what happens on the pulling apart phase, right? You try to take these two little buddies and pull them apart. And then what happens? Boing. The bond breaks. It go boom, right? Well, it's sort of like it goes the reciprocal of boom, right? Because because now it's actually the universe is putting energy in and separating these guys and the universe is tired afterwards, right? But it has separated these particles, right? So what happens now is that this is not symmetric. And this, my friends, is called the Morse potential. And nobody knows the analytical form of the Morse potential. But the better you can approximate it, the better you can estimate the um, vibrational properties of a molecule. All right. So, um, so this, I mean, this is basically just the formation of a chemical bond, right? And so it's funny to think, right, that there's like, I don't know. There's actually polarity inside of a hydrogen molecule in H2, right? This, this side is like a little bit more positive. The ends are more positive. The, 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 the in, inner part is a little bit more negative, yeah? Okay. So, um, I have a couple questions for you, and I want I'm going to create little breakout groups, and I want I want you all to come back with a cheeky ass answer to the following questions. Uh, uh, why is de by dr, which is equal to the force between the nuclei a minimum at r gets large. 
And why is the EDR equal to a maximum at R goes to zero? And where else is the E by the R equal to zero? Okay. Okay, so now Wait, what is the third question? Oh, where else is the E by the ER equal to zero? Oh, okay. At what, at, at what R value? Okay. You guys ready to be um, ripped unceremoniously from your, wait, actually. Let's see, I made nine rooms. Okay. All right. We're all in rooms now. Go be in rooms. Answer these questions. You've got uh, 10 minutes till 2.20. Hey, Chris, you are in room six. There we go. There we go. Okay. Hang out with me, Shiming. How you doing? Hey, good, good. This is, this is foundational shit, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and trust me, not everybody gets this. <laughs> no. You know? Tell them then, do they know? What is a uh, calculus? I mean, you derivative. Use, uh, yeah, derivative. derivative. No. no, 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 no. <laughs> they don't know, but they're they're the, the this will sort of get them familiar with it a little bit more. Oh, you know? yeah, 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 sure. You know, and and they're all going to be complaining about it, but that's okay. Yeah. This this is so okay. called the uh, Leonard Jones potential, right? Well, the Leonard Jones potential is a type of intermolecular potential oh, energy. Intermolecular. That is, yeah, it, it actually does not account for bonding. It's all, there's, there's a, a weak interaction that's one, minus one over R to the six. And then there's a strong repulsion that's okay. plus one over R to the 12. Okay. So as R goes down, it goes down and then up. But that... But Leonard and Jones um, did that for uh, to model kind of like hard spheres or to give hard spheres some interaction, you know. But the actual bonding for atoms is it's there is no accurate model. Okay. Oh, so yeah. Nobody. They, they all use a they're, they're, approximate model. Yeah. Right. 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 You use a Morse potential which kind of, oh, yeah. you know, it shapes oh. out, it draws that shape, right? Yeah. And it's not so different from a Leonard Jones. It's not so different. But the weird thing about it is that there's no analytical function for it. Uh, yeah. There's no, you know, anyway, I'm going to shut up now. I'm going to join a group one and, and why don't you join a group and then we can, why don't you yeah. go Five. Start at six. I'll join it. I'll start no, at one. No, cool. I Excellent. cannot jump around. I already been assigned to room five, actually. Oh, oh, okay. All righty. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I'm going to join room one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay, okay. Hello. How are we doing? Pretty good. We yeah. knocked out two questions. Excellent, 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 excellent. I wouldn't believe this guy, though. I would not believe him. <laughs> I, I, I could, I am. Mm. 
I don't he, know. He could, he could be he could be misleading you. Yeah, it it would only cause my own downfall as well. But you know, it is a there possibility. There you go. There you go. He has a he has a Spider Man picture in his room. I do. So he, I also so he have... knows that with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, I have a lot of Spider Man merch in my room and a lot of figures in general. <sighs> okay. So, um, uh, so do you have any questions? No, no questions at all. Perfectly clear. Okay. All right. Okay, good. I'm moving on. I'm moving to the next room. All right. Um, Join the room. I can say. Oh yeah, the third question. So, um. Yes. Oh no, this isn't really a question. I'm just like thinking about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. Wait, while Vigo thinks, uh, Dr. Terrell, why is there a Richard yeah. Feynman quote at the bottom of every slide? Like the same one. Oh, I don't know. I just, I started out, the first time I taught it, I had a Newton quote. And that was like kind of close to my heart because it's weird. But, and that was that um, the truth lies in simplicity and never in confusion, right? Never in complexity or confusion, right? It's absolutely true. But then, uh, and then I went to another weird one and then I found this one by Feynman saying, oh yeah, you can, there's, there's room at the bottom that that's, like if you look into into the realm of the small, there's a lot of research to be done. So it's it's you know it's my thank you, thanks for employing me. You know, cool. All righty, I'm going to room two. All right, thank you. Hi guys. Bro. Thank you. Thank thanks for your question. Bye. Analyze what everyone's doing. Oh, hello. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Good. 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 You guys want to kill me yet? No. <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. I get to live another day. <laughs> <laughs> so, how about these questions? Is it super easy or super hard or what? It's like kind of in the middle for us. We were talking oh, about good. like how yeah. uh, you assume like. Uh, for the differential equation, we could like relate it back to Coulomb's law, and then that yes. so, sort of explains why there's a minimum at like r approaching infinity and also max at r approaching zero. And then right. we're just like right. talking about the third question, about right? Where the third right? Exactly. Beautiful way to go about it. Beautiful way to go about it because, like, um, if you think about Coulomb's law, it's just a single. It just traces a single hyperbolic decay, right? Yeah. And it goes to infinity at r equals zero and then to zero at r equals infinity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then for particles, there is a minimum, right? There's a minimum point in there. And and it just, you know, it's just the way it is. I don't ha have any real like explanation other than that you can get more attracting forces together using four particles and a minimum distance, right? It's sort of like, why are there three dimensions or something? There's no real way to answer it other than that's the way it is, you know? But I, I, to me, it's also interesting that it leaves the ends of the hydrogens. Like if you have a hydrogen molecule, an H2, the ends are slightly positive, right? because the electron density is mostly in between, right? So they share their electrons that way, but that means they can't share with the rest of the world. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, it's Dell computers. I gotta answer them. I gotta answer these bastards. Hello, this is Roger Terrell. Hi, this is Harish calling from Dell computers. How are you doing? I'm good, Farish. I'm teaching right now. Can we make it quick? Thank you. Great. Bye. Uh, okay. So, um, uh, 
Yeah, so it, it, I, it's kind of interesting when you map out all the potential energy parts, but okay, I'm moving on now. Are you guys okay to let me go? Or you want me to go? Like get away, get away. Okay, <laughs> room three, joining room three. <laughs> How are we doing guys? We're doing great. Yeah. I don't, I don't believe you. Well, you should. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I like it. Conviction. So, um, Emma, uh, do you guys have answers for all these three questions? Um, I kind of have answers for the first two. Okay. All right. Um, well. Right. The first two. Yeah. Kind of with um, Coulomb's law, the equation <sighs> F equals K Q1 Q2 over R squared. Perfect, um, perfect, perfect. Well, the higher R is, you know, as it goes to infinity, um, since it's on the denominator, the F will be lower, I guess, yep. and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good, very good, very good. Yeah. All right. So, Rohan. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to have to start calling you Darth. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Vader, um, uh, why is there a um, a minimum in forces at R equals one angstrom? Because you can't be you can't push the two like or two protons closer together without causing more force, so they have to stay at mm -hmm. a. Uh, a specific distance, otherwise you exceed that force. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that, 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 okay, we had, what part of that did he miss? He said you can't push them together. Well, you can, it, it's just that it probably takes more energy to push them together and it's not right. spontaneous. Right, 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 right. Okay, how about pulling them apart? Pulling them apart will probably, again, take, energy again so yeah probably it's not exactly it, exactly right exactly right exactly right it's not like there's no way to just like explain it it's just like there's there is a sort of a happy medium and that's it you know there's 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 four particles and there's five inner particle forces you know so Anyhow, good. You guys are you guys are doing good. I mean, this is just like a small victory, but it's a real important one. Understanding molecules, atoms and molecules. I am moving forward to next room four. Thank you. Hello, guys. How are you? Good. Good. Yeah. I sort of believe you <laughs> so how do we do with the question here do we even care about it or contemplate it or um how do you do that um i didn't really understand the third one like ah. where it could be yeah so um so where else is d by dr equal to zero so where else is the, are the forces on the nuclei zero So they're, 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 when, you, when you take the two nuclei and you stretch them apart, the force between them goes to what? Vivian? Well, what do you mean by? Yeah, so like if you have these two nuclei, right? And if you have a way to measure the force between them and you take and you take you take one and i take the other one and we separate them by 100 miles do they, do they exert a force on each other anymore um, i guess not as much but no no you're right not not as much at all right we get them more than a few nanometers apart and 
one does not know about the other one anymore. Right? Makes sense, right? Yeah? Okay. So that's one place where DE by DER is zero. Yeah? And then as they start to come together, what force do they experience? Does particle one and particle two experience? I mean, there's just like attraction between the electrons, right? Uh, so there's, the yeah, there's an attraction, right? Vivian, I want to communicate with you. <laughs> As the nuclei come together, let's let the electrons be wherever they want to be, right? As the nuclei come together, from, from a great distance, they begin to feel a blank force when they get close enough. Blank is attractive or repulsive. The first force they feel as they start to come together. First force is, Jerry? Uh, repulsive. There's two electrons, right? No. Wait. No, 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 no. These are two nuclei. These oh, are two right. protons with, with electrons, yeah? They come together, and the first force that they experience, one relative to the other, one atom relative to the other atom. Atom is a proton and an electron in this case, right? The first force that they experience is attractive. On your Sorry? Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. The first force they experience is attractive. And that sort of pulls them together. And then as they if they keep going and they're gonna touch, then they experience a repulsive force, right? That's pure Coulomb repulsion there, right? Because you cannot put the, all the electrons right in between them. Right, that's, uh, uh, that's quantum mechanics, right? So the formation, of, I mean, this is a real foundational part of chemistry and physics, right? It's like how do atoms, how do molecules form and why? And the attraction is because the, the nuclei and their electrons can arrange themselves into a lower energy configuration than the separated atoms, right? They can, they, can, they can form a state that sticks together. But then as you push them together further, then they repel and the energy gets higher. Yeah, just like a spring, just like a spring. But this spring has a, this spring has a hard wall, right? Where if you try to squish it really hard, it gets super hard. And, and then it's hard to pull them apart, but then it just lets go. And that's called a soft wall. It basically you can get over the wall and then they're, then they're free. All righty. I've got to go to a new room because I am like super far behind in my rooms visiting. And then I'll be back to the How's it going? Oh, Shiming has been here. He's been harassing you guys for a while, right, Lucas? Yeah? I don't know. Have you been harassing them, Shiming? <laughs> don't answer that. Don't answer that question. Don't answer that question. That, that's not a fair question. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go to room six. <laughs> Excellent. 
How are you guys doing? Hello. Hi. Hello. You're doing pretty good, I think. Hey, hey Hannah. I can't see yeah. you. You're, you're, you're... My webcam is all messed up. Hold up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. I just... can just see the top of your head. I know. I'm here. <laughs> you're here. It's like, it's stuck. Like, I had to, like, reroute my, because my wa- computer crashed. So now I can't move oh, my monitor. Geez. Oh, geez. Oh, okay. I know. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I can hear your wonderful voice. We're close enough. So how do we do with the questions? Okay. I think we did well. I think we did pretty well. I, okay. I, I'm, yeah. I'm at least understanding this stuff. I do yeah. have a question for you, though. Yeah, please. Uh, so how does the derivative of energy with respect to R relate to force? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is force. Yeah, but yeah. What we're yeah. saying, like, uh, uh, yeah. do you, like, conceptually explain that to us? Mm-hmm. Oh, come on. <laughs> So, 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 okay. So let's take an integral approach, right? If you have a constant force and you work against it, then you raise the energy of the system, like a piston compressing a gas or something like that, right? You're raising the energy, energy, energy up, 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 right? So, what you do to raise the energy is you act against a force, right? So the derivative of the energy with respect to distance is force. Interesting. Okay, yeah. wait, one more time, explain that one more time. <laughs> okay, sure. So as you, as you increase the energy of a system by compressing it, let's say. Force times- yeah, force mm-hmm. times dx is is energy, right? right. Oh, okay. Every force gotcha. times dx oh. is energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got you. So d d d e by dx is f. Okay. You guys are awesome. I understand. All right. Thank you. That makes Thank it you. Lot yeah. Clear. Yeah. Yeah. Chris. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. Excellent. You guys are kicking butt here. I have to change rooms because uh, room seven has not seen me ever. So, hey guys, how's it going? Rachel, how's it going? Good. 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 How did how to, how to go with these stupid questions? So, I think we're gonna need for like the first uh, first two, where mm-hmm. uh, when it gets to infinity. So uh, when the R goes to infinity, um, DE over DR uh, be, uh, becomes uh, zero. And then yes. The, and the force becomes zero because when there's infinity far away, you can look at the equation KQ over, KQQ over R squared. That becomes yes. zero. And then exactly when, right. When R goes to zero, because they can right. be together and the force becomes really strong. Right, becomes- right, right. So Rachel and Brian, how, how, does that make sense to you? It, or is there any way in which it doesn't make sense to you? Okay, Brian first. Uh, kind of makes sense. Okay. So um, uh, there are the, what Coulomb's law is one of those weird natural laws, right? Where there's gravitation. There's Coulomb's law, there's um, like magnetism, there's, um, uh, there's the strong nuclear force. And these are, these are forces that have power laws, you know? And there's really no limit until things actually touch and everything goes crazy, right? But as you take two, two, two like charges and you try to push them together, it's like taking two north poles of a magnet and trying to push them together. They just fight. They just fight. You know? And and they keep fighting, you know? And and uh, it's the same like uh and then and then as they go farther apart then they no longer fight. They no longer even know about each other pretty much, right? At a great distance, right? So that's that. That's this whole argument. Like, it's like um, because our universe is made of 
positive and negatively charged stuff, right? And, and as you try to bring positive and positive together, they repel, same with negative and negative, right? But God was really nice. And he made our universe have a uh, really light positive particles and relatively heavy, sorry, really light negative particles and really light, really heavy positive particles, right? So that, so that there's this minimum in force, right? That happens as the entities approach each other, right? So if you have a hydrogen atom and a hydrogen atom, then as they come close together, then the electrons can be drawn into the intervening gap because they're light and they have they have a very wave-like character and a large extended wave-like character. And they can be drawn into the gap between the, the nuclei and that will create a minimum in the energy. But if you try to push them closer than that, then what happens, Rachel? Does that to repel? Yeah, yeah. Then, then you've got naked, naked protons. You're trying to push them together. Exactly. Cool. All right. Anyway, that's the way I think about it. So, um, I'm going to visit the next room here because I have like three more rooms to visit, and we're already out of time. Ah, uh, seven, eight, and nine. Hey guys. How are we? Are we all right? Did we do okay with the questions? I actually have a few questions. Yeah. So, um, for DE over DR, mm -hmm. are you referring to the absolute value? Um, because when you refer to it being a minimum, mm -hmm. would we take into account like the sign for like mathematically? Hmm. I'm not really sure what you're driving at there. I mean, the the minimum, if you're talking about absolute value or or signed value, it's it's gonna be the same, right? Be because you say um, it approaches a minimum as yeah. Sorry, it, it approaches a maximum as R approaches zero. Right, right, uh, right. But I, I would think that it would be a minimum actually because uh, it's uh, approaching negative infinity. Oh, 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 oh okay. So, um, so the uh, let's uh, so we can define in this coordinate system a repulsive force as positive and an attractive force as negative. Okay. Right. So, so, um, uh, honestly, it's like such a, a strange question <laughs> because it's like, so as you, if there's these two particles, right. And when they, when they come closer together, the electrons begin to share mm -hmm. and that creates an attractive force. And they attract to a certain point, and then, and then, if you try to go further than that, then oh, they're like, no, no, can't go closer than that, like, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, so that means that the the potential energy comes down, and then it goes up, and it goes up really sharply, mm -hmm. you know. So there's an asymmetric sort of a thing there, right? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, and your question, I'm sure, is a good one, but I don't, I don't really understand it well enough. Um, I can try phrasing it in a different way. I don't know if that helps. Okay, go ahead. All right. Yeah. So the question, uh, why is DE over DR um, a maximum as uh, R approaches zero? I think we were looking mm. at it from a, like, if, if we're looking for the derivative, then when the slope yes. is, it's, it might be at like a maximum in the absolute value. 
um, because it's yes. Part, but at the same time, it is negative right. when you come down. So therefore, the derivative is a negative, like a very large negative number, because that's the slope of the graph. Right. That has our mm, right, 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 right. Yeah. That is that is a weakness in my the way I'm asking this question that I had never encountered before. And I will have to think about that. <laughs> but But you get that it's a repulsive force, right? Yeah. And you get that if you try to smash them down, the energy just goes crazy high, right? Mm -hmm. Good. That's all we're really going for here. We're mm -hmm. trying to understand matter, matter, the way molecules form. Good. I'm happy, even if you guys are pissed off. <laughs> okay, good. I got to go now. I got to go back to the main group because everybody's left the rooms. So um, I'm going to close the rooms now. Buddy, I can see everybody now. I can see everyone. So, um, so far, we're going for about one slide a day. So we'll only need, only need about 150 more days to finish the class. So that's fine. I don't care. Um, because, you know, a lot of it's just basically just playtime anyway. I like to talk about instrumentation, so we can talk more about instrumentation. But this fundamental stuff I like to get through as much as possible. So um, let me reshare my share. There we go. Okay, cool. So, um, so if you understand this... Um, hydrogen molecular uh, diagram, then you're really, really going good. I mean, this is fundamental, right? And then you can sort of move on really quickly to understand things like uh, hybrid orbitals and whatnot, because basically it's just the way that electrons can occupy space between nuclei, you know? And when you, when you work through the, um, the definitions of the, the, the orbitals and all that, they just all have these, you know, straight, they have all of these Coulomb's law of potentials, right? And, and then you apply the Schrodinger equation, right? Which is, um, I, I looked it up again, and the Hamiltonian, it's like the energy of a wave, the energy, in, the kinetic energy in a wave. Right, and um, so uh, it's you know, so it's it's the way that electrons as waves can occupy space between protons, right? And and then you can solve it for a hydrogen atom, and then you can add up the hydrogen atom. You get you can get sigma bonds. <clears throat> you can also get pi bonds, right? So a sigma, you can add them symmetrically and anti-symmetrically, right? And that's because as waves, they have phase. They have a positive phase and a negative phase, right? And if you add them out of phase, they have a higher energy. And if you add them in phase, they have a lower energy. And then um, the... Uh, and then there are solutions for p orbitals, right? And if you add them in phase, you get a pi. If you add them out of or out of phase, you get a pi star. You can also get a sigma bond from a p orbital, right? And you can get a sigma star, an antibond from a p orbital. Now I've just said an awful lot, and I'd I'd like to invite some questions on that. Um, so are there any questions on that little blurb that I've just given? Let me, let me ask uh, someone to have the uh, courage to say, I don't understand. Is this just hybridization? If that, right. Well, actually this is, yeah, this is hybridization. Yeah. This is, um, this is the formation of molecular orbitals from atomic orbitals, right? Hybrid orbitals are 
they're sort of intermediate to that. There are different combinations of uh, atomic orbitals to make different geometries of, uh, 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 of uh, bonding. So that's a shitty answer, but it's sort of like hybridization, yes. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I have cool. a question. So, yes. Uh, so how does a sigma or pi bond differ from, say, like a covalent bond? Ah, so the, these are all covalent bonds, right? So they are. So, okay. um, yeah, yeah. So um, covalence, covalent, ionic, all that. that these are these are um, uh, they are they are chemistry terms, right? And they they're phenomenology, so they're not really basic science. Um, and the phenomenon of a covalent bond is associated with a substantial sharing of electron density, like H2 is a classic covalent bond. Now, if you have, if you have an, the energy of a system, if it's minimum, when an electron completely leaves one atom and completely joins another atom, and you're left with two ions that just stick together because they're oppositely charged, then that is a classic ionic bond, right? Now there's a there is a tiny bit of covalency there, right? But but uh, but you know a solvent can come along and completely break that bond, and then you'll have separate ions, right? Which can bond then basically ionically together. Was that stupid and confusing, or did that help? I mean, I get that. So, so sigma and pi bonds are basically uh, different. They're both covalent bonds. You're saying? Yes. Okay. I understand. Yes. It. Absolutely. Absolutely. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So every 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 bond that I'm showing you here is from equal electronegativity atoms, which is another. It's another phenomenology, a chem, chemist phenomenology term, but it, it it works pretty well, right? So. Um, so again, these are just ways that electrons can coexist with protons. And, and normally, you have a net bonding experience. Yeah. So um, uh, when you get to more uh, uh, more polyatomic atoms, you know, then what, what you wind up doing is um, you're always relegated to estimating the wave function for the electrons. Nobody, nobody has solved anything beyond H2 plus. And the H2 plus orbitals, they, they're beautiful, and they're they they are the progenitors of the of the bonding orbitals. But when you talk about modeling molecules with a computer or something like that, what you're always doing is combining um, atomic orbitals. Like, let's say. Um, uh, You're combining atomic orbitals into molecular orbitals in such a way that they minimize the potential energy of the system. And um, uh, and there, there, there are re related methods to that also. Um, But the point that I'm trying to make is that all of the um, all of the molecular wave functions that anybody ever did any calculation with are estimates based on the combinations of atomic orbitals. And you know, a p plus a p makes a pi, and a, you know, a, a p z plus a p z makes this a weird kind of sigma, you know, and um, 
And there's just beautiful science that relates the symmetry of these molecules to so their energies, their, their formation. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know, I have a hard time kind of letting it go because I know that we have to let this go real soon, <laughs> but um, uh, but for example, here, um, if we have a, um, let's say, let's take the molecule helium two, HE two. What is wrong with that picture? Does HE2 exist, Shiming? Wait, HE2, no. No, why not? It's a helium, right? It's a, right, right. It's a inert. Right. Inert but gas. do you know, a... do you know, do you know how many electrons HE2 shares? Each helium has two electrons, right? Yeah. Do they do they have a bonding orbital? Uh, I think it's a little bit hard for them to bond. Okay, so I'm being cheeky with Shiming, right? Because the answer here is that yes, helium. Helium molecules can exist. They don't last long, right? But the bonding electrons are, are exactly balanced by the anti-bonding electrons. So for helium, you have uh, a HOMO, which is the highest occupied molecular orbital and a lowest unoccupied molecular orbital here. And the HOMO, consists of, um, well, this is actually for a higher, this is for a system with P electrons, but the HOMO would have a sigma and a sigma star. Right? And the sigma will have no nodes and the sigma star will have one node. And so HE2, so, so in so much as it exists, is a zero net bonding uh, molecule because the stabilization gained by two electrons that are shared is offset exactly by the destabilization from two anti-bonding electrons. And there's sort of a, um, there's an approximate symmetry there, right? I'm not gonna say that there's zero that there's zero bonding between two helium atoms because that's not quite true. Because you can liquefy helium, right? You can make liquid helium and that that is where helium atoms are coming close enough together to interact, right? And form a sort of a transient bond with each other. But for every helium atom that comes close, there's a bonding, there's an equal bonding and anti-bonding component. Which makes, which makes the energy of interaction extremely low, right? So um, uh, anyway, so as a matter of fact, however, there's an interesting class of matter called uh, the exaplex. And the exaplexes uh, are, uh, they're used for lasing for uh, a lot of times for lasers. And there's, there's an argon fluoride exaplex, right? So argon is inert, right? Because it has a closed shell. And fluorine has one vacancy, right? But, um, if you uh, if you take 
one of the electrons in argon and you excite it optically into a higher state, then you have a fluorine, which is a halogen, and you have an excited state argon, which is isoelectronic with a fluorine. And they can bond to make an exaplex, right? Now, when that electron that you've excited relaxes down into the anti-bonding orbital that is of lower energy for it, then that exaplex will dissociate. But it's an example of how you can make transient bonds between atoms by temporarily moving electrons into higher orbitals. All right, so that is enough for today. We're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about band theory tomorrow, and Felix Bloch. Uh, he was a Swiss German. Jew, and he was uh, Werner Heisenberg's first PhD student. I thought that was pretty damn cool. And he and uh, Felix and Heisenberg laid the foundation for all solid state physics, especially semiconductor stuff that we're going to all learn about. Okie dokie, guys. Have you had enough from me today? Yes, you have. Yes, I notice a shadow of emotion cross your face. So I will leave you alone to enjoy your day. I hope that you've enjoyed our little get together. And uh, I will see everybody again tomorrow. And if you want to talk to Xi Ming afterwards, you can. And, um, but I am out of here. Bye, All righty. Bye. All right. Well, thank Bye. you, Dr. Terrell. Have a great day. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.